fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. It suits you really well, David. Thank you, Werner. Sorry, um, Lederhosen in XXL is not really my kind of XXL. You should so have been there when he <laughs> tried it on. I did try it on. Yeah. So. So, Werner, you are one of the world's experts in ultra scalable systems. You also had a startup, Reliable Network Solutions. You, we heard, had your military experience. And <laughs> then, 2004, you thought you were going to get a cushy job in a bookstore. And then it turned into a general retailer, a cloud services provider, an instant drone delivery company, an Alexa voice AI company, robots, $100 million Alexa VC fund, a store called Amazon Go that you don't actually have to pay for anything, leasing 40 cargo planes, winning three Oscars in February for Amazon Studios, and then you buy a supermarket. What do you do as your day job? Hmm. I have this cushy job. Oh, um, so actually when I joined in 2004, I didn't really think I was going to get a cushy job. The thing that's actually the interesting story, so I was an academic building very large-scale systems, and uh, I did consult for companies now and then. Uh, so Amazon invited me to come out and give a talk, and I go like, really? Really? It's a bookshop. What can it be? It's a web server and a database. Yeah. And so coming there really opened up my eyes for what's happening behind the scenes there. Amazon is a technology company, it's not a retailer. Anything that you would have in a computer science tech book was happening there at massive scale, whether it's uh, UI, whether it's, it's high volume transaction processing, whether it's robots in the, in the fulfillment centers, anything that you could think of was happening there. It's sort of paradise for a technologist. Not only because you think about technology and think about sort of the next generation of technology, you're actually building it and you're doing it. And so that is a major departure for any academic where you always think about sort of the future and you think about the algorithms and things like that. Here you have to build things. You can, there's no shortcuts. When we built S3, the, the storage service, you know, imagine that thing does trillions and trillions of transactions a second. And anything that, if you, at that scale, anything that can go wrong will go wrong, just percentage-wise. Yeah? But you have to build systems that, can, that are able to deal with this in real time while continue to serving your customers. That's an amazing challenge for any technologist. And that's one of the reasons, I think, why so many engineers actually stay at Amazon for a long period of time. So your job title? is Chief Technology Officer, plus you're the VP in charge of driving technology innovation inside Amazon. This is not a little company. This is, I think, the, the, the stock market cap I saw earlier today was about $459 billion. It's been listed as the fourth biggest company in the world. How do you find out what is coming next? I, what is I don't know who's saying it is, but you know, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Yeah. Um, and so for us, it, the role of a CTO, I think there's many different CTO roles in the world. And I think many of you here are of younger businesses. Often there, the CTO is also the VP of engineering, leads the engineering teams. But in larger organizations, there's many different types of CTO roles. One of them would be, for example, the CTO that is in charge of all data centers or all in, in infrastructure. And then when I joined Amazon, the role of a CTO was really that of sort of the big thinker. Like, where should we go strategically with technology? What kind of technology should we be developing to sort of support the businesses that we run? But then with the cloud, with AWS, when we became a technology provider, your role of CTO changes again. Because you become sort of an external facing technologist where you have to understand how are my customers using my products? What are the kind of things, what are the kind of pain points that they still have? And then look over many of these customers and try to figure out what are the kind of features or services that we should be building to support them. So the roles of CTO often changes over time depending on what kind of business you're in. And you did pretty much invent the cloud business. You were a key person when Amazon went into providing cloud infrastructure as a service. In the last quarter, the revenue is more than $4 billion from that business. So tell us where we are 
now with cloud computing, and where do you think we're going to go over the next two to four years? Hmm. I could tell you, but then I have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so, um, so first of all, I think the, the, the early days of cloud, where cloud really was, you know, computer storage, server storage, databases, sort of the basic fundamental pieces of infrastructure, I think those days are long gone. Yeah, I think a number of other companies are still at that particular level, but Amazon in AWS, we've more or less, over time, by, by feedback of our customers, started building more complex services. Yeah, and whether that is in mobile, whether it's in IoT, whether it is in analytics, all of these services together give customers a very deep and broad set of tools that they can pick from that they no longer have to do themselves. Um, for example, anybody that has ever built a website or a web service or even a, an app on your phone all have to include search. Yeah? Search is not a competitive differentiator, you just have to have it. Which means in the old days you have to run solar and Luzine, you have to figure out how to scale it, uh, things like that. These days, you just have a choice of two or three different cloud services, whether you use Cloud Search or Elasticsearch, and you just pick the one, and you no longer have to worry about the infrastructure that you have to run. So all these higher level services make that young businesses especially can really focus on what is their unique source instead of having to do all the same things over and over again. Now, one of the things that I think cloud computing has driven in the past years, the ch one of the radical changes that we're seeing is around deep learning. So machine learning is something that we've been doing for a long time already. If you look at Amazon, or if you are a Netflix customer or whatever, you've had um, recommendations forever, actually. Apparently, what I heard the numbers is that 70% of the Netflix customers are using recommendations to determine what they're watching. Yeah? So, and the same goes for Amazon. Recommendations are extremely important. Fraud protection, inventory level setting, all of these things are machine learning. Basically taking data from the past to make predictions about the future. The things that have changed, I think, in the past two to three years is radical shifts in um, the type of hardware at scale that is available, mostly what's called general purpose GPUs. Basically high parallel engines built by companies like Nvidia with very parallel memory that allow you to build these neural networks really fast. And together with sort of software platform advances like uh, MXNet and like CAFE and like TensorFlow um, that allow you to build these neural networks in ways that you could never do before. That allows you now to actually process data streams like video, audio, imagery at very high scale in real time. Things that weren't possible, let's say three, four, five years ago. Uh, uh, today, if a, um, if a retailer actually wants to know how customers are moving for his store, he just has to take his security footage. He has 15 security cameras in the store. And it takes that, not necessarily as a stream to be watched, but a stream to be analyzed. This is where my customers go. This is how long they spend in front of this promotion. This is how they look up and down. All these things are things that you can get from these new data streams, for these data streams, with new machine learning slash deep learning networks. So I think that is only going to increase so more and more. So we're going to be able to access artificial intelligence as a service as we are cloud processing, cloud Well, we storage. already have those now. I mean... So where does this leave people running businesses? What should they be thinking in terms of how to put AI, machine learning, at the heart of their own business? Well, first of all, I think it is just really smart to take data from the past and help you make better decisions now. So machine learning by itself, I think that's still where most companies are at today. I think, first of all, you know, cloud computing has meant that everybody has access to the same compute capabilities, the same storage, the same analytic engines. Yeah? Uh, so the different shaders between companies are going to become the data that they have, the kind of things they do with the data, the questions that they ask, the quality of the data that they have. That's really going to be sort of the different shader between companies. Now, I think many companies are still struggling to get to that point. Really making sure that they have the right data, that they know about what kind of questions to ask, how to do it. Cloud computing makes it easier for, for, for them, but it's still a practice that they have to really focus on. Now, machine learning is really being smart about the data that you have. If you have, like Amazon, we sit on billions of orders. 
Yeah? We know exactly which attributes fraudulent orders had. And you can make use of that machine learning to then, if a new order comes in, to determine what's the likelihood that this is a fraudulent order or not. And so making use of data from the past to make smart decisions about the future, I think is sort of the first step that companies are going to go for. One of the areas of machine learning Amazon's made a huge investment in is voice. That's deep learning, by the way. Yeah? But well, okay. <laughs> there's different buzzwords people okay, are, are using for it. But it's, it's a, a form of artificial intelligence yeah. in an application that can reach billions of people. Yeah. Where do we go after voice as the way to interface with the network? So first of all, I think, and we may not realize that yet, everyone, that voice is one of the major revolutions that we're going to see around digital systems. Mostly because until now, all our digital systems, for the past 50 years, the interface to them has been driven by what the computer was capable of doing. A screen, a keyboard, a mouse, your finger, at best. Yeah? It's not how we wanted to communicate, yeah? it's how the computer forces you to communicate with it. Yeah? Look, we're talking, we're not, this is not a Slack channel where we're typing, we're talking. And so it's much more natural to actually have natural human interfaces to your digital systems. And that is, that goes across the board. You know, and I think we will see a big change in the way that we are building our digital systems by giving them more human-centric interfaces instead of computer-centric interfaces. A great story there is um, we have a customer uh, outside Manila, uh, which is the International Rice Research Institute. These guys are amazing. You should look them up. And so they have about 70,000 different strands of rice in their freezer. It's amazing. Um, so they, built, they also built these support systems for farmers. And so one thing that they built was a system where farmers could describe their, their patch of land and then they would give advice about how much fertilizer to use and when to apply it. Um, turns out nobody used it. Why not? Because all the farmers that they were targeting didn't have computers at home. They didn't have smartphones. I mean, luckily they may have a cell phone or maybe there's one phone in the village. So they changed it and had gave it a voice interface. So now farmers can call into this system and describe the patch of land and they will, the machine learning goes off and does all the, the fancy stuff and then comes back and gives them advice about how much fertilizer to use and when to apply it. Yeah? Until they put that voice system in place, nobody used it. Voice system, everybody uses it. Yeah? And as such, you see that whole groups of individuals are now able to use digital systems in all sorts of circumstances where they otherwise wouldn't be. If you're a young mother and you have a kid and it's ill and you have it on your arm, you're not going to WebMD and fill out a form. You want to scream at that thing and tell, tell me what to do. Yeah? And as such, human-centric interfaces are really going to be sort of the next phase in how we build our digital systems. The interesting thing is then, what do we do on the back end? Yeah? Now if you have Alexa and all the skills and things like that, I think there's tens of thousands of skills on, uh, on Alexa right now but they mostly interact with systems that have been built for pages or cards or things like that. How are you going to build our computer systems or our digital systems differently when conversation is going to be the main interface to these digital systems instead of just showing us pages? I'm going to ask you some very quick fire questions because we have <laughs> a superstar who's almost as big a superstar as you are in AI in cloud, but in a different field. After voice, a lot of people are now putting investment into the brain directly interfacing with the network. Elon Musk yeah. set up a company called Neuralink. Is Amazon thinking about what the brain computer interface is gonna be? I have nothing to announce at this moment. I read that signal, I actually read that <laughs> signal. Quick, other question. Some people in the room are pretty excited about this thing called the blockchain. Mm -hmm. To what extent does the blockchain figure in your thinking about how to transform the way Amazon does business? Um, so I've always, I mean, there's a long history around decentralized systems. I think 
there are a number of use cases where decentralization really can help individuals. I think easy applications of that are, for example, around censorship, yeah, where there's no centralized control how to control content. Um, for other things, I think from a, uh, from a technology's point of view, so first of all, I love the technology, but I think there's a number of other technologies that we understand really well. Um, and so you have to balance these things against each other. So if you would use blockchain to build a decentralized storage system, for example, you have to trade it off against how Dropbox does their work. Yeah, and so, which is centralized storage with massive caching, which is a technology we understand really well, and we can build it at scale. Yeah, then going to a blockchain-driven storage system, you have to have a really good use case that actually supports that at scale. Remember, blockchain supports, was it seven transactions a second? It's very hard to build scalable systems at that particular level. And so we need to figure out how to build better protocols and maybe where proof of work so that the crypto is not necessary to actually sort of um, amend the transactions that we have. Uh, and where we need to look for more scalable solutions if we want this decentralization to really have a good application in the world. I think on Prime Day, your systems were taking about 13 million requests a second, so there is a bit of a gap. Um, yep. Quick, like 30 second question, hard to do this in 30 seconds. Top message for people here on maintaining security oh, of their networks. Yeah. Only 30 seconds. <laughs> this is not fair. Security is the one and most foremost thing that you can do for your customers. Without security, you don't have a business. And for each and every one of you who is a young business and your startup founder in this audience, you should start with security on day one. Do not make this something that you sprinkle over your system afterwards. If you remember, without security, you do not have a business. Yeah? Protecting your customers and your crucial business information, it should be paramount, should be the first thing that you do. At Amazon, it will be forever our number one investment area. And whether that is in retail or whether it's in the cloud, yeah, security will forever be our number one investment area and number one priority, and it should be yours as well. Uh, there's a website uh, that we run called Security by Design, which gives you a whole set of sort of guidelines about how to start thinking about building a business or building a new application, whether you're a young business or whether you're a an, an large enterprise, how to integrate security from day one and how to think about it. Please check these things out because it is crucial to protect your customers. He also has time to blog. It's a pretty good blog, all things distributed. And I'm going to give you one quick last question. Which city should Amazon build its new headquarters? <laughs> Amsterdam, of course. <laughs> Werner Vogels. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.